Just before I get started in the message this morning, uh, some of you might not be aware, we actually launched something called an Adoption Assistance Program. And uh, it is out of the uh, really generosity of people within our church. The average adoption costs between $30,000 and $50,000 in the state of New York. And there are some uh, couples who, th they're, they're close, but they can't get over that hump. And sometimes they have to walk away from wanting and having a child in their home just because of finances. So if you know someone and you might wonder, do they have to be a member of our church? They have to be a believer and they have to be connected to a church. But if you know someone who's interested in that, uh, they can contact us. We have an application process for them to walk through and uh, you might be the person that helps them, uh, their dreams uh, come true of having a child in their home. So just wanted to make, make you aware of that. Uh, 9-11 last year, 9-11 uh, 2022, uh, we began the series in Matthew, and today is the final message in the Gospel of Matthew. We finally made it to uh, chapter uh, 28, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a phenomenal journey. It, it really has opened our eyes a lot to what it is uh, to be a disciple of Jesus, and interestingly enough, this last chapter doesn't end with the resurrection. This last chapter ends with the Great Commission. And so we're going to take a look at it this morning in uh, chapter 28, beginning verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards, so afraid of him, that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. I want to begin our, our thoughts this morning by uh, this idea that might surprise some people, and that is God actually invites investigation. It's the first light of the new day of the week, and and these women are approaching the tomb, and they have some reasons for doing that. And we know one is Mary Magdalene, and interesting, she's a, a prominent feature in these last chapters of Matthew. She was at the death of Jesus, she was at the burial of Jesus, and now we see her at the empty tomb. And there's another Mary who is also there. And what's interesting is the number of times the word see and look show up in the passage that we just read. Over and over, Matthew wants us to understand that what we are going to find out about is actually based on an eyewitness account. This is not some altered state of consciousness, some spiritual trance, a vision or a dream, that what is about to be experienced has, is based on eyewitness testimony. And so it's also interesting that we don't have a description of the resurrection itself. Like, how did this happen? And uh, th that intrigues me. I would actually have been interested in that. And it's one of the things that adds credibility to the story. If you were making up the story, you would probably have a version of how Jesus raised from the dead. But, but we actually don't see any information on the resurrection. We just see the resurrected Jesus. And I think this is important for us. It's, it's, it, when you think about it, it's often how God works. When we need something from him in our lives, we actually often do not see how he is working it out. We just see it when it's done. That's part of the journey of faith. So 
the angel rolled away the stone that had shut up the tomb. And the purpose is not to let Jesus out. He's not a live person trapped in a grave. He's letting the women in so that they can see he is no longer there. The angel terrified the guards. By the way, angels do not actually look like the little cherubs that we see printed on cards and in cartoons. If you see an angel, it will probably uh, deeply distress you. And uh, uh, the, what's funny is that the guards shake violently and fall down like they're dead. So the people who are supposed to be alive are acting like they're dead, and the person who's supposed to be dead is actually alive. It's an interesting little play that happens there. And then the angel says to the women, do not be afraid. Uh, this command is to keep the same thing from happening to them that happened to the guards. And I think there's something to see even here. And that is the commands of God do not just give us direction, they give us strength. These women do not fall down and, and, and they do not become as though they are dead. There's something about that command that gave strength to them. When, when we are very afraid, fear demands our attention and it paralyzes us. Uh, you probably at some point have had a dream in your life where something bad was about to happen and you, you were frozen, you, you couldn't move. Uh, some people have even experienced that in real life. Fear has a capacity not only to limit our field of vision significantly, but to, to restrict our capacity to respond. And that's why we need commands from God to help alleviate our fear. It's not just him rebuking us for being afraid. There's something in his command that strengthens us in our fear. He says, I know you're looking for Jesus, the one who was crucified, the crucified Jesus. The, the angel doesn't say, he's not really here. He's, he'll be with us from now on. He'll always be in our hearts and our thoughts. These are the things that we say to each other when we're grieving the loss of a loved one. He doesn't say that. He says, he is going ahead of you to Galilee and you are going to see him. So this is a problem for both materialists and mystics. The resurrection creates problems for almost everyone. The materialists don't have any, uh, any option for a supernatural intervention. It's just matter, it's just energy. Like there's, there's, no, there's no way something like this could happen. And for the mystic, there's no need for something like this to happen because the body is just, a, it, it's a limiting capacity within our lives. So, so why would we not want to be free of all of that? And so the resurrection challenges both the materialists and, and those who are mystics. But what, what Matthew wants us to know is Jesus is fully alive. And that fact had a profound effect on his disciples. The gospel is good news. And the good news is not that we just remember the good things Jesus said and that he inspires us or he's an example for us. The good news is that he is alive, fully alive. How many think that is good news? It really is. It's good news. So what does it tell us? It tells us God is greater than anything, including death. And it also gives us a reasonable hope that there's something beyond that moment when our, when our lungs exhale for the last time or our heart beats for the last time. And it gives us something of a purpose in life. And the angel said, he's not here, he has risen just as he said. Because in, in chapters 12 and chapter 16 and chapter 17 and chapters 20 and chapter 26, Jesus kept telling them, I'm going to die, I'm going to raise from the dead. Then the angel says, come and see the place where you live. Come and see. He invites the investigation. I love this. There are some people who think that you can't be scientifically minded and have any respect for faith. And the truth is, is that come and see is a scientific response to a claim about resurrection. The angel doesn't, he doesn't stand there. He's not like the Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. That's not what he does. Come and see. In, in Christianity, questions do not equal unbelief. Questions are welcome. Jesus wants believers to be honest. Pretending and faith are not the same thing. We should not confuse them. 
He wants us to think. He wants us to use our brains. In fact, why don't you just put your best smile on that you, you're capable of, right? And look at the person next to you and say, God wants you to use your brains. <laughs> he does. He does. Some of you are taking advantage of that and saying a lot more than I asked you to say. <laughs> What's interesting to me here too is that the first commissioned witnesses of the resurrection are actually women. Uh, this also adds credibility to the story because in those days women were not given a lot of credibility. In fact, they were often not considered valid witnesses in a court of law. And so if you were making up the story about the resurrection, you would definitely have had men be the first witnesses of the resurrection. But we, we cannot ignore what God is doing here. And by the way, this brings up a topic that is a little bit sensitive, particularly in certain religious cultures, and sometimes a set of assumptions uh, by our, our culture in general, and even some disagreement within Christianity. And that has to do with, well, what are we to make of women in ministry? Is this something that is approved by Scripture? Is it something that is forbidden by Scripture? How, how are we supposed to think about this? And you probably already have an opinion about that coming in. And your opinion might be based in Scripture, and it might just be based on, on a conviction that uh, all human beings should be treated equally. Um, what I want us to see is that Scripture actually gives us some remarkable examples that we should not ignore. For example, when Jesus talked to the woman at the well of Samaria, the Samaritan woman then went back into her town and she spread the good news and asked everybody to come see a prophet who told her all about her life. And the whole town comes out. God, God actually uses her to bring the whole town to Jesus. In all four Gospels, the first witnesses of the resurrection and the first ones who communicate the truth of the resurrection, in all four Gospels, it's women. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter's standing up and trying to bring some sense to what people are witnessing and what people are experiencing, one of the things he said is, this is actually foretold by a prophet in the Old Testament. And he says that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Now the challenge is, is that there are two verses of Scripture, one in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the other in, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 14, and it seems to limit what women can do in a religious setting or in a worship setting. And so there are lots of people who have pounded the nail on those two passages of Scripture to the exclusion of everything else Scripture says about it. Now, I wish I could tell you that there are no times in Scripture where there's not a tension between truths. See, some people think all truth is in harmony. That's not true. Truth can create tension. For example, if I were to ask you, don't raise your hands, just give me your best poker face right now. Just look straight ahead. I have no idea you have a full house, okay? Somebody's wondering what a full house is. <laughs> Google it, okay? So, okay. So we look at these situations and what we see is there's a tension. Do you believe that God is in control of all things? Once again, poker face. Do you believe you have any personal autonomy to make a decision for yourself? The Bible teaches both things. The Bible does not teach that you are just an automaton living out the programming given you. How foolish would it be to actually believe that artificial intelligence is greater than what God gave you? But does that mean God is not in control? And the answer is no. It's, well, how can both of those things be true? With God, they can be true. With us, it's a problem. And we look at verses of Scripture, and there are whole groups of Christianity that, based on those two verses of Scripture, have completely silenced an, an entire gender for being used by God. And the question I have is, so why are they okay with the other times that God used women in Scripture? So there's a tension point. It's not wrong to acknowledge it, but it is inappropriate 
to go and cancel out whole passages of Scripture just because it doesn't agree with a passage that you found. Does that make sense? Okay. Somebody says, do you have another point? Move on. So he says, go quickly. There's a sense of urgency and tell. This is what's fascinating. Once you learn the good news about Jesus, the first command for you is to share it with someone else. I love that. And uh, so God uses those who were there. Uh, and, and Jesus calls people to follow him throughout his life. But he also told these dis, uh, the women to tell the disciples, and he's going to say it again to them directly, is, is that uh, they need to go to Galilee. Now, Galilee is not just a block down. Galilee is 70 miles away. Now, I don't know how long it takes to walk 70 miles. I've never done it. I'm going to assume longer than a day. There's something that Jesus is incorporating here in our understanding, and that is that faith is always a journey and it's always in motion. This idea that faith is just, I believe certain things and now I'm, I'm in a club or I'm, that, that's not what faith is. Jesus calls us to follow him. Jesus is in motion. Jesus did not say just to watch him. He said, follow him. And Jesus is moving through our world today. So the women are hurrying, and it says that they are filled with two things, fear and joy. How is that possible? Any parent knows what that's like. Any person about to get married knows what that's like. There's a reason that people get anxious at weddings. And it's a combination of fear and joy. And, and so they run into Jesus, and uh, a couple things happen. One is uh, Jesus says greetings. He sa basically, he says hi. It's the most informal way that you can greet someone. Interestingly enough, this word can be interpreted a number of ways. So if you're familiar with the passage in Philippians where Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord, I will say it again, rejoice. It's that word, greetings, because back then greetings was actually a happy thing. And, and Jesus says this to them, what, is, what can we take away from this? And that is, Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus didn't change him into somebody else. He's still Jesus. He's still approachable. He's still friendly. They grab his feet. This is a really interesting thing. I had never had an experience like this in my life until I went to India. And I did something to help someone. And uh, actually, they were asking me to help. And uh, I, I, I was having to work through an interpreter. There were things that were unclear. And the person reached down, and they, they touched my feet. I've never experienced that. And it, it set off a chain reaction of emotions in me I had no idea I had. And uh, there was something about that that touched my heart. There was something they needed. There was something very, it, it seemed honoring, it, like it, it wasn't threatening at all. And so in one way, the women are honoring Jesus. But there's another thing I think we can take away from this. And that is, we all have presuppositions, and assumptions about God, about who he is, about how he responds in our world. And I think one of the things that this passage tells us is give up all your presuppositions and lay hold of Jesus because he tells us everything we need to know about God. And he's physical. Like when they go to grab his feet, it's not like their hands go through him. He's physical. It's a resurrected Jesus. I'm going to move pretty quickly through this next section, but God expects opposition while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that happened. So they told them what happened. They saw the angel. They collapsed. They, they couldn't move. They were paralyzed. And when the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan and gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them, you are to say, the disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were sleeping. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. 
So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. What we see is while one mission is being carried out to share the good news of the resurrection of Jesus, another mission is launched to try to stop that message. And so they offer these soldiers a sum of money. It's sizable, and in case you don't know, the Praetorium Guard were actually mercenaries. They were paid for their wages. It wasn't in scripted service like, like uh, some militaries have or even Rome had at that time. And so they are going to get paid, but it's also true that if you fell asleep on the job, you could, you could forfeit your life for that. And the religious leaders are so concerned that, that that information would get out that they concoct a story and then they pay off the, uh, the soldiers and they tell them if this news gets to the governor and he wants to exact punishment upon you, don't worry, we'll take care of him too because everyone has a price. That's their philosophy. And, and so they carried out their plan. The, to me, I, d did you notice this? There's a flaw in their, their statement. If you were asleep, how do you know who came? How do you know it was the disciples? How do you know they stole the body? If you're asleep, you're asleep. Doesn't make sense. But that's what they did. What is interesting is that even though Matthew sees that there is a counter mission to quash any belief in the resurrection of Jesus, what's interesting is he acknowledges it, but he's not overly vexed by it. He expects it and he doesn't go about fighting it. Sometimes Christians are only known for the things that we are against and the things that we fight. And what we can learn from this passage is, let's be known by what, we for, what we're for. Jesus is alive, he is well. In fact, in ancient Christianity, there was, there was a statement, a way that they would greet each other. And they would say, the, the person who's greeting them said, Jesus is risen, and everyone else would say, some of you don't know this ancient greeting, so this is a good time to learn it, just in case you ever time travel back into ancient Christianity, and you need to know this. The, the response is, he is risen indeed. So, Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. You are ready for time travel. Good. <laughs> Why is the resurrection so important? Paul talked about it this way, and I'm reading this from the message translation. Face it. If there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. And everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you, verifying that God has raised up Christ. Sheer fabrications if there's no resurrection. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't, because he was indeed dead. And if Christ wasn't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who have died hoping in Christ and resurrection because they're already in their graves. And if all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is, but the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. <laughs> Isn't that good news? I think so. Let's continue on in Matthew 28. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. The command, move out. Go. Keep going. Talk to people until they believe. Live out your faith in a way that causes them to ask questions. Share what Jesus has said 
with them. We move out by living out our faith. We move out by sharing what Jesus has told us. And, uh, and Jesus says, into all the world, because he does not want anyone to be left out. We have a lot of human barriers, and Jesus is saying, ignore all of them. Oh, their language is different. Their ethnicity is different. Their social economic status is different. Their educational capacities are different. Their, their styles are different. Jesus tells us to ignore every single barrier between us and anyone else because every single person on the face of this planet has the right to know about the grace of God. Go and keep going. When can we be done? Not yet. The disciples met together with Jesus. What's interesting is that they're all together. They're all together. I'll be the first one to tell you that your personal relationship with God is absolutely essential. There's something very private and, and very powerful about it. But it is not meant to be a substitute for gathering with other believers. Jesus met with all of them. And it says they worshiped and some doubted. How is that possible? They're seeing the resurrected Jesus. You probably have said the same thing about other people that you thought had enough evidence of faith in their life to warrant their making a decision or staying faithful. How is it possible that some could doubt? And the answer is some doubt. When I ask the worship team to come. Luke tells us a story about the disciples coming to Jesus one time because they felt their faith was too small. And they asked Jesus, increase our faith. And Jesus does not tell them how to increase their faith. He tells them that even with the smallest amount of faith, you can expect unbelievable things. We're always trying to get to the place where faith is no longer required where we're so convinced, we're so convicted that, that nothing can shake us, nothing can move us. These are individuals who are having a struggle because they knew he was crucified and he's standing in front of them and they can't make sense of it. There are some people in this room, when it comes time to worship, your lips remain sealed and you remain silent because you know you harbor doubt. And what I want you to see from this passage of scripture is that it says they worshiped and some doubted. Don't let your doubts be greater than your capacity to worship. You can still acknowledge a true thing about God even if you're not fully convinced about it yet. And this is why it's important because when you speak truth, something inside of you gets stronger. And we need that today. So go into all the world. Go and keep going. Don't give up. Live out your faith. But I have doubts. Yes, it's okay. Here's something to try. Doubt your doubts. Try doubting those once in a while. And stand in the gap. Look for people who don't yet know about the grace of God and live your life in such a way they might ask you, why do you live like that? And you can tell them all of the good news. Heavenly Father, would you help us today in our doubts and in our fears to see your commands as not just a directional thing, but an empowering thing, and to run, understand that even though we have doubts, it doesn't have to paralyze us. You're not offended by them. You're not limited by them, that we can still worship you in Jesus' name, amen. Here's an opportunity. Let's all stand and worship together.